A few weeks ago, I did a video defending the depiction of Superman as a pillar of virtue and going against the notion that he should be criticized for not being complex, instead noting that he should be admired for having an iron will rather than be dismissed because of it. And that got me thinking of how far movies have come as a whole since the most early days of the silent era. And specifically how at one time people would criticize a movie if the hero wasn't heroic enough or did some questionable things. Whereas these days people often criticize the hero if he's too good or doesn't delve into moral ambiguity. And I just couldn't help but ask myself, is depicting the hero that way a good thing? As human beings, we tend to base our ideas of morality around everything we do. And if the heroes in the stories we tell are meant to represent that morality, at least most of the time anyway, then what does that really say about us if we care more about a character being realistic or having layers to them than them being an actual hero. I mean, sure, not every character can be Superman, but I still believe it's indicative of the fact that people's priorities have become a little misplaced when it comes to the depictions of the characters. And that's not even getting into all the other issues this grayer take on the hero presents as well. And today, I would like to try and explore all of this. Is it a good thing that Hollywood seems more interested in complex heroes these days, or not? And spoilers for one or two things may abound in this video, so in case I bring up something you don't want ruined, you might just want to be on the lookout. Okay, so to start off simply, in modern terms, the main character or hero of any given story is a person who's meant to represent the good side of humanity, and in some cases may even represent who most people would like to be in a more ideal world. Now, of course, there are many variations to this, but the point generally comes down to the fact that the main character is usually also the hero. Now, as I've already covered in what feels like a hundred other videos, audiences generally love the villain because they like watching the bad guy be charismatic and evil. However, the audience generally loves and roots for the hero or heroine for a very different reason. Because most people in this world generally try to be good people or see themselves as having more in common with a hero than a villain, as befitting the fact that being a good person is important to most people. As a result, they often relate to the hero extremely well, sympathize with their wants and struggles, and want to see them succeed in the end. To put it another way, audiences connect with the hero because they either see themselves or people they know in them. And because they're good people and generally prove that fact somehow, it's kind of impossible for an audience mostly comprised of good people not to want to root for their triumph, especially because they can't help them directly. But this often becomes trickier when the hero is portrayed too, quote-unquote, realistically. Because as I touched on in my video on why the villain is important, and you can find the link in the description, audiences can be very judgmental and harsh on the characters in a story. So if you want them to sympathize with a flawed hero, then it has to be explored in a lot of detail why they do what they do, as well as have them own up to their mistakes. Otherwise, it's very easy for the audience to lose sympathy for them. And if you don't believe that's really the case, just trust me when I say, 
I've seen that happen way too many times before. Audiences can have a very low tolerance for a hero intentionally doing something wrong under most circumstances, though there are plenty of exceptions to this, of course. But generally speaking, the more clearly on the side of good a character is, the more inclined the audience is to like them. And that's what leads right into my next point. People generally seem to like characters that are nice and just all around good people the best. Again, they can have their flaws, but audiences generally prefer when these flaws aren't too prominent and their good nature is what's most notable about them. And once again, I believe that part of this simply stems from human nature. We like people who are nice to us and don't like people who aren't. That's why audiences like the hero and don't like the villain. Because the hero is a good person and the villain isn't. That's kind of the whole point of the good guy and bad guy dynamic, actually. And the more good a hero is, the better. Because if their flaws are expressed too heavily, or has them make too many poor decisions, then it's all the more likely that people will stop having sympathy for them. To put it another way, while black and white morality may not be quote-unquote realistic, it's something that people like to see. They like to see a hero who wants to do the right thing just because and a villain who wants to do bad things just because they're evil. Because even if it's not always accurate to the real world, it's still very indicative of the moral battle that goes on in every human being. Every person has an eternal struggle between their good side and evil side. So watching those two personifications shown on screen in a fictional story and the good side always winning Ow, it can be very compelling and comforting to them, as it reminds them that they can be a good person, and that it's always important to never succumb to the temptations of evil. Now sure, sometimes people want something more accurate to the real world, or a hero that isn't so morally pure, and there's nothing wrong with that. The point is simply that there are reasons why people sometimes prefer a more black-and-white depiction of morality in fictional stories. And for a long time, that was one of Hollywood's specialities. From the 1920s all the way until the 2000s, most of their movies famously had a designated good guy and bad guy, and the audience would generally root for the hero and cheer when the villain was defeated. Now, obviously, there are plenty of exceptions to that, as if that exact process happened in every movie, then things would get pretty boring. But on the whole, that was their basic formula. They even had a notable habit of making characters better or worse than they were in their source material in movie adaptations in order to make who the good characters and the bad characters more thoroughly defined. And one of the best examples I have for this is actually a farce, how to succeed at business without really trying. A satire of corporate America and how business works, the 1967 movie was directly based off the famous 1961 play, which in turn was adapted from a book written in 1952. But for the purposes of this video, I'll only be discussing the play and its movie adaptation. Now, in the play, the main character is depicted as an insanely ambitious window washer who decides to climb the corporate ladder the easy way, buying a book that tells him how to do just that, and employing every method it tells him to, no matter how unethical or even illegal it actually is. And in the end, he gets what he wants, 
having stepped over and ruined several people so he could become the president of a huge corporation. Now, obviously, this isn't exactly the kind of guy one normally wants to see succeed most of the time, and might even be considered something of a villain in certain circles. But nonetheless, the writers want you to root for him, and he ultimately does come out on top in the end. But when it came time to do the 1967 movie adaptation, Hollywood wanted a slightly different take on the character. And the result is a Finch that's still insanely ambitious, but comes across as more of a nerd with slight self-esteem issues as well. And while he still does go to somewhat extreme methods to get ahead and doesn't seem all that sorry about it, he doesn't take things nearly as far as he does in the play. And just one example of this is that in the movie, the book tells him to throw everybody under the bus to save himself, but decides not to do that after his girlfriend gets mad at him for even considering it, and opts to save everybody's job instead, whereas in the play, he does throw the others to the wolves and ultimately triumphs because of it. And they also switch a few of the songs around, so he comes across as less arrogant and more like he is in need of confidence and self-worth. So, needless to say, because of all these changes, the Finch in the movie version comes across as more likable than he does in the play. Sure, he still isn't a conventional hero, but at least he's a man you can root for and sympathize with. And many actually liked his portrayal of the character better, to the point that subsequent revivals of the play alternated between these two depictions, with some opting for the more sympathetic portrayal in the movie adaptation than the more ruthlessly ambitious man of the original 1961 stage production. And a major reason for this is because while the original play is most definitely a satire, and Finch's depiction is meant to serve that, having him be more likable gives the audience a more definitive person to like and root for. Because if everybody in the story is a scrupulous jerk, then why should the audience even care at all unless they all get taken down in the end? And that's another thing to consider here. People like to make heroes of other people. They like to look up to others, see nothing but the best in humanity, and say, I want to be like that person. But unfortunately, as many will undoubtedly already know, people aren't always who they seem to be. And way too many of them have been propped up as heroes and actually turned out to be horrible people behind closed doors. And that's why people will sometimes turn to movies instead for their role models and heroes. Because as a fictional person, you know that whatever you see on screen is exactly who they really are. And given the fact that they aren't real, it's a lot easier to put your trust in them, as it's not like you're ever going to actually meet them in real life. And for a long time, this worked really well. Several actors became synonymous with playing heroes and good guys in several movies, and people loved them for it because they loved the characters they were playing. Whether it was Douglas Fairbanks, Tyrone Power, or Errol Flynn fighting off evil villains and swashbucklers, John Wayne or Randolph Scott shooting it out in westerns, or even somebody like James Stewart defying a villain much more powerful than him against all odds, people loved watching these characters on screen because you could truly admire them and understand that these were real, tried-and-true heroes you were looking at. Now, once again, not every movie from that era took this approach, 
but specifically when it came to the good guy, they generally tried to make sure that they were genuinely nice so that they would definitely have the audience's sympathy. There was a time and place for moral ambiguity, yes, and that's why the noir genre stood out so much. Because it wasn't afraid to go to much more into morally gray territory. Though even then, there was a definitive good guy and bad guy more often than you'd think. But when they wanted to muddy the water, they most definitely did it. Make no mistake about it. And this does even extend outside the noir genre as well. You could find plain old dramas, adventures, or even comedies where even the best person isn't exactly the greatest. But what's important to remember is that for every movie to depict grayer morality, there were also movies depicting old-fashioned black and white morality to balance this out. Now, obviously, some of this had to do with the infamous censorship of the era, and believe me when I say that it sometimes led to supposedly good characters that end up coming across as totally insufferable in their self-righteousness, but thankfully they weren't usually the main character of the story. But the point is, even if moral barriers had to be somewhat defined most of the time, there's no denying that audiences responded well to it. As I just said before, when a good guy was well written and most definitely a hero, audiences loved them. Even if they had their flaws, they still usually loved them because they were ultimately able to overcome their flaws rather than let them drag down their whole character as people strive to do in the real world all the time. These were people that they could admire. People that one gender would want and the other would want to be. And believe it or not, that is what many people looked and still look for in a hero and role model. Today, however, Heroes are generally written off if they don't have some kind of crippling flaw or do things they shouldn't. Nobody seems interested in a plain old hero standing for idyllic values anymore. But at the same time, what those heroes stand for are things that should be valued. Just because society has changed in certain ways doesn't mean our understanding of morality has. You can go back and watch any number of classics, and most would still admit that the good guys in them really were true heroes. But they'd probably also decry them as boring or not edgy enough. And I really just have to say, is this what we've been reduced to? That a hero's flaws are considered more compelling to people than their good deeds or their unbreakable moral compass? Now listen, I already got into all of this in my Superman video, so I won't repeat that here. All I am going to say is that a good person is more than their greatest weakness. If a man saves a million people, doesn't that mean more than the fact that he sometimes gets parking tickets for speeding? Or if a person has a moral code that they will not break no matter what, doesn't it say more for their character if they don't break it even when forced into a corner than if they do? And some would argue that the difference is that if they don't break their code, even under the most extreme conditions, then that makes them more of an ideal. If they can't do it, then that makes them more quote-unquote realistic. But the thing is, isn't that the whole point of heroes sometimes? For them to do what we normal people can't? To show that what they represent, no matter what it is, is unbreakable no matter what odds it faces? Didn't people used to love the hero for the good they could do that we couldn't, instead of resenting them for it? Because simply put, 
People want to see an ideal sometimes, because it's all too simple to see the real thing in real life. And listen, as I've already said, there's nothing wrong with a hero that's complex or has flaws. I'm simply saying that they shouldn't come to define the heroes by those flaws. Because, as sad as it is to say, fictional heroes are arguably all some people have. And if even they are brought down to our level and are revealed to not be as good as we thought, then what role models do we really have left? And what does that really show about how we actually view people that truly are heroes, both in fiction and in real life? All right, I think I've spoken my piece for long enough. So now I wanted to hear what you guys think. Do you believe that some people have gone too far in wanting to see fictional heroes be more complex and humanized? Or do you believe this whole thing isn't even an issue and that I'm overreacting? Please feel free to discuss how your thoughts are in the comments. And listen, you do not have to agree with any opinions expressed here just because you watched this video. You can love any kind of hero that you want to, and believe that the direction they've been taken in is perfect if you wish. And thank you all for watching. I very much appreciate it, and I hope to see you all next time.